right uh, welcome to uh, the distinguished lecture series uh, hosted by the packaging research center and also with uh, chips at ucla uh, my name is madhavan swaminathan i serve as uh, the director of the packaging research center here at georgia tech and today we have a very eminent speaker professor subramaniam ayer who's going to be presenting on flexible hybrid electronics 2.0 uh, Professor Ayer is a very well-known figure uh, in this field, so I'm going to give a very short introduction about him. He's the Distinguished Professor and holds the Charles P. Reams Endowed Chair in the Electrical Engineering Department, along with a joint appointment in the Material Science and Engineering Department at the University of California, Los Angeles. He also serves as the Director of the Center for heterogeneous integration and performance scaling, also called UCLA CHIPS. Prior to that, he was an IBM fellow. He has had several uh, uh, key technical contributions under his uh, belt that include the first uh, SIGI base uh, HPT, salicide, electrical fuses, embedded DRAM, 45 nanometer technology node, and many more. He has many, many publications to his credit and holds over 75 patents. His work has been recognized through numerous awards. So with that, I'm going to uh, pass on the floor to Professor Ayer. We call him Professor Subu Ayer. So Subu, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you so much, Madhavan. And uh, I am actually quite delighted to be here. Uh, uh, and uh, I also want to thank you, Madhavan, for agreeing so graciously to make this uh, PRC Distinguished Lecture uh, Series a joint series. And hopefully we can uh, work together and make this even more successful than it's al already been. I've been attending your uh, PRC lectures for many, many months, many almost a year. So I'm actually um, very happy that uh, we're doing this together and uh, hopefully there's more to come. So uh, good afternoon and good morning to all of you. Uh, I'm gonna be talking about something called Flexible Hybrid Electronics 2.0. And um, before I do that, I did want to say a few words about UCLA CHIPS. I mean, it's a partnership led by UCLA to develop applications, enablement in core technologies, and most importantly, right, the ecosystem required for continuing Moore's law at the package and system integration levels. But as I always tell people, right, our biggest product is not necessarily our research, although that is important. It is actually our students and our scholars who develop these efforts and lead these efforts. And so our, you know, I'm actually uh, very focused on our students. Uh, our research areas of interest are basically in the advanced packaging technology area for both rigid and flexible electronics, uh, wafer scale integration, medical engineering applications, and of course, embedded memory and in-memory compute for AI ML applications. So what we've covered today, all right? So before we go flexible, uh, we really need to understand what is happening with advanced packaging. Okay, it's a very, very hot field now. And what is it, what, what do we mean by advanced packaging? What is this whole concept of heterogeneous integration? The whole concept of chiplets and dialects. Okay, so I'll try to cover that very briefly in the beginning. Then we'll talk about what I call flexible hybrid electronics 1.0, which is what we have pretty much today in, 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 a, in the commercial arena. And then we'll talk about what we have to do to make, make flexible hybrid electronics 2.0 and share with you where we are on that. I also want to bring to your attention the uh, HIR roadmap, the, the heterogeneous integration roadmap that is co-sponsored by the Packaging Society uh, of IEEE, as well as several other societies, the Photonic Society and the uh, uh, Electron Device Society, as well as some other societies as well. And uh, this is the website for their, uh, their roadmap documentation. There are about 22 chapters which cover pretty much everything under the sun that's related to advanced packaging and heterogeneous integration. So it's a great resource. So let's talk about silicon and package scaling. So
So if you go back to 1967, okay, when we were building, say, uh, transistors that had channel lengths of several microns, and uh, in, in 1967, uh, we, and so if you look at the blue curve here, which is scaled on the left-hand side, you see that the dimensions, the minimum dimensions of these uh, features have gone from like several microns, say 10 microns or so, down today to seven nanometers. And so that corresponds to an aerial density improvement of several million. Now, what is important to note here is that the scaling will continue at least for another two generations or so. So scaling itself has not stopped. However, the economics of scaling has changed. And if you think about Moore's law, it is this economics that is actually stalled, and which is why a lot of people say, hey, you know what, Moore's law is stalling. But it, has not, it is not yet the state where you know, innovation in device technology and all that has stalled. We continue to innovate out there. Now, if you look at the red curve, it represents packaging metrics, okay? And these packaging metrics can be anything on the package. They could be the C4 bumps, the uh, copper pillars, they could be traces on the PC board, whatever. And when normalized, you know, the red curve is how they have scaled. So let's take C4 bumps, which is what I've represented in this picture. In 1967, the C4 technology was introduced by IBM and it had a, uh, a bump pitch, a C4 pitch of about 400 microns. And over the and notice also that the red red curve axis is a linear axis, while the blue curve axis is a logarithmic axis. Okay, so you see that for most part till about 2010 or so, the uh, scaling of the packaging metrics has been fairly modest at best. Now, if you look at sort of how. Uh, this has scaled in the last, say, several years, say 2015 to today, okay, there is a steep improvement, okay, or steep uh, slope in the scaling metrics for the package. And I blow this up a little bit. Again, remember that the scales are different. There's a long scale for silicon and there is a linear scale for packaging. And remember also that the, the scales are nanometers for silicon and microns for packaging. So we're still very, very far away. And it is this uh, sort of inflection, okay, if you wish, that we often refer to as advanced packaging. And uh, there's also concomitant with this inflection has been the so-called dialect chiplet revolution. So what has happened there? Why has packaging taken off? Okay, packaging has taken off for two reasons. One, the economics of scaling silicon has actually become not as attractive, although for certain high-end applications, it still is a good, good bet. But more importantly, advanced packaging has borrowed immensely from silicon technology. And by applying these silicon technology constructs, okay, we're able to actually scale the package a little better. And that's very important to keep in mind. So what has changed the paradigm also is the adoption of, at the design level, the adoption of SOC methods to package systems. Okay, and I described this in a paper in 2015, and uh, it is actually pretty much happening everywhere right now. So what we do is in an SOC, we have IP blocks. What we've done now in advanced packaging is we've converted those IP blocks into chiplets. And these chiplets are instantiated as hard dialets. And these dialets are either stacked, so we have 3D stacks, or integrated side by side at fine pitch. And that is usually done in interposers. Okay. So these are the key sort of changes in the technology borrowing silicon technology, moving the SOC uh, sort of methodology into the packaging realm and then using these technologies such as stack dies and side-by-side -side integration at fine pitch using interposers. So now if you look at where we were, if you look at this roadmap, and I, I have used this for a long time, actually uh, since 2012 at IBM, in the prehistoric time, and the prehistoric time is actually less than 10 years ago. We, we had things like MCMs, these MCMs could be either ceramic, 
or they could be uh, organic. And we had a bunch of chips on these on these MCMs, and these were known as multi-chip markers, right? And very soon we came to the conclusion, and, and uh, uh, this usually uh, I instantiate this with uh, a processor and memory, where the memory is the cache memory. So very quickly, right around 2000, and we were doing this since the late 90s, and around 2007-ish or so, we came to the conclusion that the package was really slowing down the latency, okay, of the caches. And so we said, look, I mean, the only way to fix this problem is to actually integrate the cache, the e embedded DRAM cache onto the processor chip. And that was a big era of monolithic integration, which went on for, the, for another 10 years everywhere, where people were integrating and making chips bigger and bigger. In fact, Today, right, some of these um, processor chips are about the size of the reticle, okay, somewhere around 800 square millimeters. And at that stage, right, you reach a point where you don't ask how many die do you get to the wafer, you ask how many wafers do you need to get one die, okay? And that actually spawned a whole new approach. And one of them is actually interposers. Uh, interposers are side-by-side -side integration on a silicon substrate. And you can see an interposer that we actually started manufacturing as a product actually in 2013, where we had a 45 nanometer ASIC die along with two SIGI dies. And this is actually the first true uh, heterogeneous integration at fine pitch uh, example that I can give you. Uh, we also kind of looked at things like stack die, for example, ca putting the ca uh, cache and the processor stacking them. And also we worked with uh, a Micron to build what is called the HMC, the hybrid memory cube. And there's an uh, analogous thing called the HBM, which is also a stack memory die. And there's also a lot of work being done in monolithic uh, 3D integration and wafer to wafer integration, such as in, um, in uh, uh, sensors, you know, CCD sensors and uh, CMOS sensors for all your cameras. So these are all, products now that e exist in the market, they're done. So what is happening? There are some more observations, right? The interposers are getting bigger and bigger. The 3D stacks are getting taller and taller. For example, the A100 from NVIDIA is now about two reticle fields across, while the 3D stacks, people are talking about 16 high DRAM stacks, okay? And this obviously cannot go on forever either. And so, the next step actually is what I think is going to happen is actually wafer scale integration. And we're actually doing that at UCLA, trying to build very large systems. For example, a data center complete or HPC completely on one wafer, okay? But it's a heterogeneous system, okay, with multiple dyes from multiple sources. So heterogeneous integration is a very, very long journey, and we have yet far to go. Okay, so some of the features that I think are important to keep in mind are we use relatively small, high yielding, hardened IP dialects. In other words, unlike in the typical SOC where we integrate soft IP and then harden the integrated IP on a chip, we actually harden the IP separately and then use this. Okay, and the Die sizes we want actually for this, and we've discussed this in that paper at uh, which I showed in the previous chart, are typically around one millimeter squared to about 100 millimeters squared. So at this point, right, they're easy to handle, which is very important, and they yield very well, okay, at over 95% or so, and they're also easy to, to test. The other very important thing here is at these dimensions, right, these dyes are, have a very, very high degree of reuse. In other words, they are reasonably general purpose that multiple users can synthesize systems using heterogeneous integration to build different systems with the same dyes. So for example, we could en envisage a situation where we had something like an Amazon for dialects, and you could actually download these dialects and reintegrate them on any system that you feel like. Another very important, important feature of heterogeneous integration is the pitch. And today we're sitting around 50, nanome, 50 micron pitch for, uh, for interposers, right? But I think to actually really push this technology, we have to get down to about 10, to two mi 10 micron to two micron pitch. And those pitches, okay, the, there is really little distinction, okay, between say a, 
a package integration and a SOC integration on a single monolithic die. And that is really where we want to go. The other very important thing is close dialect to dialect spacing. Okay, why? Because if you think about an SOC, the different IP blocks are basically butting each other. There's zero space. We can't do that in packaging because we have to mechanically align. And while these alignment schemes are improving, the best we can do today is about plus or minus one micron. Okay, so the uh, the dialect spacing, the best dialect spacing we can do today is about less than 20 microns. We probably can push it down to about 10 microns. And finally, the trace on these uh, on these substrates, which in our case we use silicon, which is really a great packaging material, is about one to four microns. And you can see some of these pictures here of the, these assemblies of heterogeneous dyes, you know, memory dyes and processor dyes at fine spacing and fine pitch interconnect. Okay, and these dyes can have different sizes, they can be arrayed in different ways and so on and so forth. So this is what we really mean by heterogeneous integration, right? And this has got at least uh, legs to run for another, like I would say 20 years or so. So how does all this relate to flexible hybrid electronics? So uh, if we can follow this paradigm for flexible electronics, then the possibility of high performance as well as low power flexible devices can happen and we can open a myriad of new applications. What do I mean by that? So for example, right, let's take uh, a, 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 a sort of a phenomenon called uh, you know, epilepsy where you know, people go into these uncontrollable fits, right? And these are known to occur because of electrical instabilities in the brain. So what people can do is they can actually monitor brain activity and watch these oscillations grow and then apply stimulation to actually dampen those oscillations. Unfortunately, you know, and you can actually detect these oscillations almost 24 hours before an epileptic fit is going to occur. So what do we do today? Today, we actually uh, have electrodes that we slap onto the guy's head Okay, and then there's this ponytail of cables that goes off to a very high performance um, sort of a computer, which is actually monitoring this thing. And as you can imagine, right, this is very inconvenient and you can only do this for about half an hour or so. And so you really can't uh, make, make the best use of the technology yet because everything now is so big and tethered. So one of my colleagues, Dejan Markovic, actually is trying to make all this thing very small and he has something known as a cracker stack, which is a bunch of, of uh, 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 PC boards that he get, then slaps onto the guy's head, okay, and he sticks it there and the guy can walk around a little bit with this. But as you can imagine, right, this is hardly convenient, okay? But it's an improvement. And it's certainly in the lab, you can use it. Now, what we have been doing actually using uh, flexible hybrid electronics is making this thing extremely small and using something known as wafer level fan out technology to actually integrate very high performance dyes and electrodes and multiple electrodes to actually do something as called surface electromyography. We'll talk about that later. But the point I want to make here is that everything now is completely wireless. You can power this thing wirelessly. You can actually read the data wirelessly. You can send it to any device you feel like, send it to the cloud and can be monitored. So you, the patient now uh, can go and be extremely mobile. Now, for all this to happen, Okay, a lot of new things have to take place, and that is what we'll talk about in this in this talk. So there are many, many approaches to flexibility. One of the classical ones is that thinner is more flexible. So any material that you take, okay, can bend if made sufficiently thin, okay, and you can sort of figure all this out from a very from an, your undergraduate material science class or solid uh, mechanics class uh, through what is called Stoney's equation. And so you can compute what the stress is, okay? And if you say that the yield limiting stress is about one oh, the Young's modulus divided by 100, you can see for a silicon uh, die or a silicon element, okay? You can actually, if you can thin this thing down to about 70 microns, 
you can have a radius of curvature before the spring breaks of about five millimeters. And so any material when made sufficiently thin will actually do this. Okay, and so this has been the classical approach, okay, to, to flexibility or bendability. So very early uh, approaches to flexible hybrid uh, 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 electronics was the thin PCB integration approach. And I call that kind of flexible, okay? And basically what it is, you take something like Capcom or whatever, you look at it as a PC board and basically slap a whole bunch of dies. And you can see, right, this is a work that was done some years ago by Khan and et al at Binghamton. And, uh, uh, and so this, uh, this uh, kind of approach obviously was very good in, in the old days, but as you can see, it's not necessarily very, very, very user-friendly. More recently, actually a very classical and very popular sort of device is the uh, MC10, which is uh, uh, basically built with a bunch of small uh, PC boards, which are separately assembled and then connected in a flexible fabric, okay, which I show you here. And uh, so you can see these PC boards and these, are, these things are connected with serpentine wires, okay, that give it a certain degree of flexibility. And this whole thing is embedded in a flexible matrix like this and molded around. And, and this is sort of a very, very good uh, thing. I think a lot of things can be done with this, with devices like this. Okay, uh, uh, Georgia Tech has some very interesting stuff and we do self surface electromyography. And again, it is based on this uh, sort of thin PCB approach. And you can, you can sort of uh, make these things somewhat flexible and use it for many, many applications. And finally, right, I wanna bring up, there's also the whole idea of printed electronics where you actually use uh, sort of uh, printed uh, 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 conductors on say Kapton or some thin uh, flexible material. And then we put, Thin dies. So here it shows you uh, in the in the bottom inset here uh, what happens if the dies are thin. What happens if the dies are thick? If the dies are thick, they will tend to delaminate. Notice also that the pitches for these are actually very very large. You know, typically 400, 500 micron type of pitches for the wiring. Okay, and you can you can find you can get these things actually commercially made today in in many places. So I think you know the first generation of flexible hybrid electronics is is well established, and it is actually very very useful. But in order to go the next to the next level, where you need much more flexibility and the ability to integrate a variety of dyes, okay, high performance dyes, you need finer interconnects, and all the things that I told you about advanced packaging are equally applicable to flexible hybrid electronics. We don't have to wait for another 40 years for us to actually do this like we did in classical packaging. We can actually do this even today. And I'm gonna tell you how we at least at UCLA do this. So another thing about pinning dies is that they, it does not come free, okay? We do have actually the problem that uh, thin dyes uh, have lower performance, they have more defects and so on and so forth. And the stresses in the thin dyes can alter the uh, performance of the devices, okay? And so in the left panel, you can see this work from Tohoku University, where they show that the retention time of a thin, very thin uh, uh, DRAM actually degrades dramatically as you get below like 20 microns or so. And similarly, uh, the work by Chen et al. Okay, shows that the, the uh, I.O. devices, for example, or any device uh, sufficiently close to a stressed region, okay, will show different characteristics, and therefore, you know, your models, okay, for these devices will change, and so that is uh, another concern, okay, of trying to thin them. So you really do not want to thin semiconductors to below about 70 microns, okay, which is in the case of silicon, a five millimeter bending radius. There is another approach to flexibility, and that is elastomeric substrates. So elastomeric materials have very large limiting strains and will stretch quite a bit before breaking. So some classical examples, of course, are the classical rubber band that we use every day, 
O-rings. If you are a silicon uh, uh, technologist, you know that you have every and you use vacuum systems. You use O-rings, and almost everybody who drives or goes from one place to another has used rubber tires. Okay, so how do we use these elastomeric substrates to do uh, uh, fre flexible hybrid electronics? So if you look at some co uh, sort of commonly used packaging materials, I've tabulated some very important thing, important parameters here related to flexibility. One is the Young's modulus, okay? Which, uh, and remember this, the, the, the larger the Young's modulus, okay, the, more, the stiffer this material is, but the smaller the Young's modulus, the more it can flex. But remember, if the material is brittle, it will break. So we need another thing. We need to know what we can do. For example, one figure of merit is actually the elongation percentage at break. In other words, if I stretch this thing, how much will it elongate before it breaks? Okay. And essentially what we see here is that for all these materials that are classically used in, in, in packaging, right? These rigid materials more or less are very, very um, uh, sort of uh, not very conducive for for uh, packaging, except possibly SU8, which has a low Young's modulus and uh, can actually bend. The other thing we want to worry about is actually the biocompatibility. And so some of these are biocompatible, some are not, because most of these flexible applications are applications that you would put, for example, on your skin or implant into your body. However, there is a lot, there are a lot of materials, okay, which have excellent properties okay and for example if you look at the the silicone rubbers okay elastomers they are fantastic in the sense that they have low young's modulus and they have enormous uh, elongation and break for example uh, silgard which is one of the materials we use okay has an elongation of break at break at about 500 percent so in other words you can actually pull this thing about 5x before the thing will tear apart okay and we can bend this thing to almost uh, zero uh, millimeter radius. In other words, we can fold it on itself and nothing will happen. All right, so, so obviously then, if you want to kind of make truly, truly, truly flexible materials rather than bendable materials, okay, you would want to use these, um, these elastomeric materials, which are extremely bendable. And so what we have been using actually is uh, uh, a, a, a silicone uh, material uh, we call uh, which is biocompatible as well okay and if if the if the application is not biocompatible you can use silicones that are not biocompatible and they actually even have better properties so if we had fhe 2.0 that was truly truly flexible okay what we would want to be able to do are the following we would like to integrate high performance processors so that we can actually do all the processing directly there and we don't have to rely on some old technology and so on. We can use significantly lower power electronics. In other words, we can take the best that we Moore's law has given us in silicon. We can add memory so we can store stuff on it. We can do heterogeneous dial-up integration. We can do innovative wireless power delivery and energy storage, okay? fine pitch interconnects and wireless external co communication and flexible substrates that conform and can be inserted as well as flexible displays. And so pretty much we will be able to do everything that we would want to make any, any versatile system that we can think of. So how do we do this? So we've taken a very old idea Okay, the bicycle chain. So I show you on the left a rusted bicycle chain that I found, we found, uh, that exists. And what do you notice about the bicycle chain? Is it consists of a number of links. Notice that these links are rigid. However, the joint between two links is flexible. And so even though the bicycle chain is composed of these rigid links, the overall bicycle chain is reasonably flexible. So what we do actually here is we take really these small dialects that we talked about. You know, I talked about the whole dialect revolution in the early part of this, of this talk. We take these small dialects and then we embed them in this flexible matrix. Okay, this, uh, you know, this um, silicone-based uh, uh, flexible matrix that we call PDMS, polydimethyl siloxane. And we then connect these, these different dyes with wiring that is short 
and high pitch. And now what we have is we have an advanced package for flexible hybrid electronics that has pretty much all the characteristics that today's advanced rigid packaging has, but with the additional advantage that one, it is fle very flexible, two, it actually can fold almost, and three, it actually has fine pitch connections between the dies. So how exactly do we do this? So we use a classical technique uh, that is now, now classical technique called fan out wafer level uh, packaging. And so what we do is we take a uh, temporary handler and this could be glass or it could be silicon. Uh, we, uh, glass is a, a, a good conductor and this is a very good use for glass and packaging, I think. Um, we, we then sort of place these, the dies that we want to integrate uh, face down on a, uh, uh, an adhesive layer. This is a thermally releasable adhesive. Okay, and the temperature of release for this is actually in our case around 90 Celsius. Now, what happens now is that we place these dies very accurately because we have alignment marks on the glass and we have alignment marks on the die. So we can place these dies within plus or minus one micron of the alignment marks, okay? So all these dies are now placed and then we dispense PDMS on top of this, okay? And then mold the PDMS okay, with another handler, with another uh, uh, sort of uh, adhesive. This adhesive actually releases at a slightly higher temperature. So in our case, around 120 or 130 degrees Celsius. And then, okay, so now we have, we have to cure the PDMS. So we cure the PDMS and we do this curing actually overnight at room temperature. So it's a very, very low pro temperature process. And this is what we call compression molding. This is very similar to what is done in, in standard uh, wafer level fan out packaging, except that we do this all at low temperature. And the molding compound is not, does not, after curing, does not become rigid, it stays flexible. And then what we do is we flip this thing, we take off the first handler, and now we have all these dies facing up, okay? And we can now do lithography on them. We can put some stress buffer layers. They're, they're necessary because I'll, I'll tell you why. And um, we can then pattern this thing. And we use SU8, okay, uh, as our uh, uh, material here. And then we actually do what is known as corrugated copper interconnects. We do this by electroplating, the same process that we use in silicon. And I'll tell you in a, in a few charts why we corrugate this, the, the wires. And then we take off the bottom handler and what we're left with is a bunch of dies that are connected at fine pitch. Today, our pitch is about 40 microns. Okay, and this is the pitch, the pad pitch at which we connect the different dies. And we believe we can go down to about 20 microns or so. So this whole assembly and this, uh, this substrate and this whole process, we call flex straight. Okay, it stands for flexible substrate, as you can imagine. And this is actually how we build most of our devices. So what I have here actually is a, 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 a good video that has been made by, by my graduate student, Arsalan Alam. Uh, and let me play this for you so you can see it. Yes, yeah, so as you can see, right, this is a very manufacturable process, okay, and uh, we, oh, sorry, and we use basically the same technology for die placement as we use for rigid electronics, 
we have actually transferred this process to a company called i3 electronics and they can actually do this now and they we've been exchanging samples and qualifying their process uh, for this flex trade process right now let's talk about the wiring okay now typically right uh, you as you may have seen in some of the previous pictures uh, people have used what are called serpentine wires so serpentine wires are two dimensional wires that are uh, are sort of uh, up, go up and uh, sideways, laterally serpentine. And these allow you to actually uh, bend and stretch the substrate without the wires actually doing. This is very useful when you have printed wiring circuit, printed wires. In our case, right, what happens is that the uh, when we release the, the uh, uh, PDMS, cured PDMS from the second handler with the wiring on it, Okay, the, the PDMS has shrunk because it has been cured. And when that happens, right, there's a longitudinal compressive stress that is put on the wires. And what would happen is that these wires would actually buckle. You know, any, any wire, when you apply a longitudinal stress, will buckle. And these buckling amplitudes, okay, are very, very significant. They could be as much as 15 or so microns peak to trough. Okay, now if you try to put a second wiring layer and so on and so forth on this, it's going to be very difficult. And also such huge sort of variations like of 50 microns are completely unacceptable. So we trick the system. What we do is we put our own corrugations. Okay, so as you know that the, the uh, propensity to buckle is uh, uh, depends on square of the, the length of the member. And so we can actually, by reducing this uh, to about five micron uh, sort of uh, corrugations, we can pretty much eliminate, okay, the buckling or make it significantly smaller, okay? And you can see here, okay, uh, on the right, uh, these uh, uh, corrugations um, that have uh, been impressed on the, uh, on the wires. And you can see in the bottom here, okay, uh, uh, you can see all these, uh, in this case, something like 600 plus dies that are all connected with, with wires that are corrugated. Uh, obviously, the next thing to do is to see whether you can put another wiring level and sure enough, you can do that and you can uh, connect these things, look at their, uh, all, the, all the characteristics of this. So we can make two wiring levels that are corrugated and these are being reliably bendable to one millimeter bending radius for over 3000 bending cycles. So if you see here, right, what, what I show you here is a, a bending machine. And uh, this actually bends the uh, bends these structures. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the resistance increase, okay, after 6,000 bending cycles at one millimeter bending radius is barely 7%. So this is completely acceptable. And in fact, we understand why the resistance increases by the 7%. At the very first few bending cycles, okay, there are micro cracks that are developed, and these micro cracks actually in the copper, they don't make the, the copper discontinuous, but they do actually slightly increase the resistance of the wire. So these are uh, very, very, very good, and you know you can't do this level of bending and this radius of bending, okay, in uh, say FHE 1.0 or FHE 0, 0.0. So this is actually very unique. So what have we done with this? So for example, my student Gautam has uh, basically built a wireless power system using flex straight. So basically we have a wireless power transfer and this is done at 13.56. This is a very standard uh, uh, frequency for wireless transfer for ma many, many portable devices. And we basically shown that you can actually bend this thing and power up, you know, say an LED for uh, some display uh, at, at various bending radii, okay? And there is very little, and we can we can sort of transfer the power reasonably well, okay, all the way down to about four or four or so millimeter bending radius. Uh, we made a, a, a seven segment uh, displays, for example, and let me see if this will play. And you can actually bend these displays, okay? We can make them in any, any colors, and you can see here that you can actually fold these things. To really, 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 uh, you can literally fold it to zero degrees, okay, and they still are functional. Uh, um, this work was actually done by Arslan, and uh, 
we've also done uh, flexible high resolution displays and this work is still in progress. But once again, you can see that we can um, use micro LEDs, put drivers and so on and so forth, as you can see in this picture here and actually build, build uh, high resolution, uh, uh, sorry, greater than 200 uh, 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 PPI uh, resolution, okay? And these are all flexible. So these also have a lot of good applications. So our vision, okay, for this is actually to build a heterogeneous system, okay? And essentially we have multiple dyes, multiple sensors. For example, you have amplifiers, you have other optional dyes and sensors, you have electrodes, you, uh, you can uh, resistors, various passives, wireless power transfer, batteries, flexible batteries, and um, uh, Bluetooth antennas, et cetera, et cetera. And you can integrate these things, okay, on both sides, okay, of this flex straight substrate. You can roll them up and do whatever you want. You can actually, you know, crush them and put them in your pocket, take them out, and they'll still work. So think about a phone now, for example, that you could actually put in your pocket and 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 crush. So there are lots and lots of like cool applications. And the reason we're able to do this is basically we can integrate almost anything that is in can be made into dialect form, including batteries. For example, we are now looking at what are called batlets. Okay, which can are small flex batteries that uh, have uh, uh, sizes of the order of a couple of millimeters on a side, and we can integrate these on the back side. Okay, so that they and also the wireless power transfer can be put on the back side, and this whole thing can be then connected to the front side through what we call through flex straight vias. Okay, so these are all the same kinds of processes that we use in advanced packaging, but the exact details of how you do it are slightly different. Uh, now, one of the things we're doing is we're targeting something known as flex SEMG, surface electromyography, and we're targeting two applications. One application actually is spinal surgery. As you know, backache actually is one of the biggest, biggest problems. I mean, uh, that face almost everybody at some point in their time and their lives, okay? And so how do, and, and today, right, sometimes, you know, you have to do spinal cord surgery to fix the problem, right? And so how do we do Spinal cord surgery. We work with a with a surgeon in our spinal uh, 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 surgery department, uh, Dr. Luke Maxesian, and he showed us what is used today. What is used today is biography things, which are all wired, and they're connected to a big computer. And there's a specialized person who's actually watching the signals that come out of this this device, and the doctor is constantly applying cranial stimulation, that is stimulation to the head, okay? And that causes sort of uh, um, electro, uh, so electrical signal to go down to the extremities. And these, extre these electrical signals at the extremities are picked up by this electromyography system and then presented on a screen, which the attendant uh, looks, operator looks at and tells the doctor, hey doc, you're going too close to your to this thing and then the signal is getting messed up. And as you can imagine, these signals are very weak and they're also very noisy. So this is an art and apparently you have to pay this guy like 5,000 bucks an hour to be watching this. It's very, very intense application. So what we would like to do actually is replace this whole thing with a, 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 a flex straight based uh, SEMG system. And another actually thing is uh, physiotherapy and rehab, okay? And we're working with a professor at Cal State LA, Professor Salvan Joseph, and we can do, again, continuous tracking, injury prevention, and so on and so forth. So basically you can look here and see that this patch that we create on FlexTrade, which can do pretty much all that this guy can do here, is a small little thing that can slap onto your, your body, okay? In this case, to your bicep muscles. And you can have wireless uh, transmission and you can monitor this thing, you can send it to the cloud. And uh, normally, right, I mean, this is used for rehab of say war, um, war veterans who have suffered uh, sort of say uh, uh, damage to their limbs, for example. And unfortunately today, right, you can only do these, uh, this monitoring, right, this therapeutic monitoring in the facility where you're doing things because everything is connected and, and not easy to analyze, okay? 
uh, as I said, these signals do have uh, sort of are, are generally noisy and so on. However, now, okay, you can slap this thing on the guy and tell him to go home and all the data is being collected and transmitted to the cloud. And this is a much better and much richer experience for everybody concerned. So these are two sort of big changes that can happen, okay, if we are able to make these things small, flexible, and usable. So what is holding us back? One of the things that are holding us back is what is holding us our components. Small, bare, high performance, low power dialects. And so for example, okay, here is a, a, a Bluetooth, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a, a, a multi-channel amplifier die that we get from a company called Intentech. Okay, and they actually sell this as a package die. Uh, we have asked them for bare dialects and they were very nice. They actually gave us some bare dialects. And you can see there's a tremendous reduction, a 13X reduction in volume and weight, okay, when you're going from a package die into a bare die, okay? And uh, these bare dies are obviously smaller, thinner, lighter, but they're very hard to come by, okay? And so this is actually one of the things. The other sort of thing is if you notice, right, most of the dies and chips that are made for flexible hydroelectronics are actually made in a much older technology. And the argument actually is that, oh, the older technologies are cheaper. Yes, they may be cheaper at the, at the chip level, but at the system level, they actually cost a lot more. So if you could take this 0.35 micron bare die, this um, we could, and move it say to not even the lead, bleeding edge technology, say 45 nanometer technology, we would have an 8x reduction in the area and volume. The power would go down by almost two to the five. So we would be now at about 100 microwatts versus milliwatts. And the performance actually would also increase. So while die level older technologies are cheaper, at the integrated system level, they are more costly. And this is often referred to as swap. So we need to develop a supply chain of bare die in later nodes and offer as standard a no package option. That is, we can buy these dies. So very often today, what we do with these uh, is we actually, uh, we can't get bare dies, so we buy packaged dies, and then we, we actually depackage these dies. And then we have to test these dies again to make sure they're good after the depackaging, and then we can use them. This is like an insane process, okay? We should be able to get bare dies. And um, because the dyes are all bare at some point in their life, right? So uh, this is a very, very important uh, consideration. Another thing that is holding us back are actually the availability of passes. Okay, so resistors, inductors, capacitors, antennas, and so on. Those actually are very, take up also a huge area and they're very difficult to integrate because they're very big. So what we are doing actually, we're saying, hey, look, you know, we don't have to use these, uh, can't, we'll use like, uh, integration, uh, monolithic integration technology to integrate resistors, inductors, capacitors, and antennas directly onto the flex space substrate. And we've done that, for example, in the wireless transfer where the coils are all completely integrated in, on the on the flex space. So we can do this with indu inductors, we can do this with resistors, antennas, and even trench capacitors. The other, the biggest problem we have, of course, is power and energy storage. And so Basically, this is really the critical thing. So you can make these things really small, but you cannot power them because there's not enough, there's not enough battery storage or storage technology available. So for example, right, we do have actually one proof of concept by a company called ITN, and they're able to build something that has a 99 microamps per millimeter cube sort of uh, uh, metric, okay? But even that, okay, if you think about it, okay, will basically uh, last only a few hours, okay? Uh, uh, and you can see that, for example, for the surface electromyography system, if you were using for eight hours, we needed something like 131 milliamp hours. And for two days, okay, we would need something like 3000 milliamp hours. Such battery technology actually does not necessarily exist in small enough form factor today. And so we need to actually think about how how we're going to be able to do this. So this is another aspect of, uh, of, of this problem that absolutely needs to be solved. So let me conclude. I think uh, Flexible Hydroelectronics 1.0 has opened up a really, really vibrant and diverse market for flexible devices, especially 
uh, devices that are medical uh, medical devices, devices for uh, uh, quality of life and wellness, and so on and so forth. So this is actually fantastic. Okay. The next phase, which I call FHE 2.0, is basically doing what we do so well in the electronics industry. Scale the system, make it lower cost, get more flexibility, get higher performance, lower the power, and have much better energy storage, and importantly, address the supply chain issues on bare dialects. So once again, right, FHE 2.0, will borrow extensively from advanced packaging, all the concepts that we're doing today and silicon technology, okay? And that is what is gonna make this thing extremely, extremely powerful. So I would like to thank uh, all the members of the UCLA CHIPS Consortium, okay, for their support of this. Uh, I, I also want to call out um, Vico because they've been actually helping us a lot on uh, the, um, flexible electronics and applied materials as well. And, uh, all, uh, and obviously the funding agencies, most of the flex work actually has been funded by ARL through FlexTech and SEMI. Uh, and of course, the most important thing is our students and alums. Arslan Alam has done a lot of the surface electromyography work and he just defended his dissertation. So it's uh, Dr. Alam, I think now. And Gautam Ahilarazu is, um, uh, Elanasu is actually working on flexible displays. Guanji is working on batteries. Randy is actually working on a, a really, really interesting problem of very high density active connectors, okay, we call FlexCon. And uh, I didn't get a chance to actually talk about it, but it's actually very exciting. And I also want to thank our alums, okay, Professor Tak Fukushima, who is now uh, at Tohoku University, spent a year and a half with us and actually did much of the initial work on developing the flex trade process. Amir Hanna, who is actually at Keysight, has uh, also been very instrumental in developing his work, and Samta Benedict, who now is at Bits Pilani in India. So thank you again, and uh, I think uh, we are ready now to, uh, to open it up for questions or comments or suggestions or whatever. Madhavan, all yours. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Subhu, for that uh, wonderful talk, okay? So we have a few questions that have been posted in the chat oh, box. I'm going to read okay. it to you and then you can respond. And meanwhile, for the others, please go ahead and post questions. We still have some time left. So we can have uh, uh, Professor Subhu Ayer answer those questions. So the first question, uh, Subhu, is, says, thank you for the great talk. In the process flow slide, what thermal release tapes are used for double-sided handlers? Is 60 degrees centigrade temperature difference enough to make sure that the handler on the other side is not debonded? Uh, good, good question. Uh, we use a class of tapes actually called Rivalfa. And uh, yes, uh, 60 degrees uh, difference is more than enough. Actually, even 20 degrees is more than enough to prevent them from. Uh, uh, sort of delaminating. So the mechanism uh, by which the delamination, there actually the tape is, not, I, I had a chart on this, but I took it out for lack of time. The tape is actually a composite of many different adhesives. And there is one layer actually, which can say, consists of these micro bubbles. And when you heat it up, these micro bubbles expand to the point that they, they burst and that causes the tape to exfoliate, okay? And you don't have to, and, and the, the process actually is uh, very reliable, okay? And um, you can, it, it requires a little bit of assistance to get everything off, but this is not, not a problem. And yes, you know, so the 60 degrees is more than enough. Thanks, Subo. Uh, the next question is, it says, uh, Professor, thanks for the presentation. Are you able to comment on the economies of screened high quality chiplets more? Wow. That, that's a tough one. I think, uh, yes. So here, this is a problem that is common to all advanced packaging, okay? And by its very nature, when we sort of think, use things like vapor level fan out, when we do um, interposers and so on, what we give up, for, we get performance obviously, but what we give up is reworkability, okay? And so 
unlike in the good old days where you could sort of hang your uh, MCM upside down, heat it, and the dye would fall off, okay, we can't do that anymore. Uh, once we put it on, it's on, and there's no way to fix it. So there's a lot of work that is being done to address that problem. First of all, the, the known good dye issue is a very big one. And uh, certainly, right, the other big, big thing that helps is actually when you make the diet small enough, and what is small enough, like I said, right, one square millimeter to several square millimeters in size, then, okay, you can actually uh, have a very good probability that the dye will actually yield, okay? And more importantly, right, because we can integrate a whole bunch of these small dyes, and we actually have this, we follow this approach in our silicon intercollect fabric as well, we build into the, into the system a certain level of redundancy. So, and we have what are called routing chips. We have, we have a, a concept of what is called the knife, which is very similar to the, um, uh, so it's a network on interconnect fabric. It's very similar to the concept of NOC, you know, network on chip, where, you know, you can actually do uh, at the system level, built-in cell tests that will detect chips that are not good, okay? And basically route around them. Okay, and so when you have build these large systems, okay, they're good. Now, for many of the systems that I talked about today, the flexible systems, the number of dyes are actually reasonably low and you can actually screen them. Now, our screening process today is manual, but I can see this becoming automated and to lower the cost. So yes, uh, so in, at both ends of the spectrum, I think solutions exist but it does require you to go away from this uh, uh, classical packaging thing where you know we rely on on rework to a more system level approach where we say hey look the system will work and we will have redundancy and we will have go arounds okay to make sure if something doesn't work we'll we'll have we'll have another way of getting to where we want to get to i hope i answered that question sure Thanks, thanks, Subo. So we have just three minutes left, but there are several questions over here. So I'll try to go through as many as I can. Okay, and I'll try to answer them fast. <laughs> okay, so the next question is, uh, does flexible electronics have challenges and possible solutions about thermal management of the chips? Oh, wonderful, wonderful question. So I didn't get a chance to talk about, but Randy Irwin, the, the student on the extreme right here, has been working on something known as TT. TPDMS, okay, thermal PDMS, where it actually puts uh, uh, copper nanowires, embeds the copper nanowires as a net percolating net thermal network in the PDMS and goes. We can also, by the way, put put sort of cooling channels and so on and so forth in the PDMS and use uh, liquid cooling as well because uh, you know these things are reasonably big as you saw in the pictures, and so there's room to actually do those things. So yes, uh, cooling is a concern, and actually the Important to note that even though the the thermal loads are low, when you put something on your skin, right, a five degree increase in temperature is extremely uncomfortable. Okay, and the other thing is you have to worry about is is uh, perspiration. Okay, and so all these things have to be taken care of. So ergonomic design of these things, and I really didn't get a chance to talk about it. Ergonomic design of these patches are actually very very important. And we will, uh, you know, maybe at some other time we can talk about those. Okay. Next one, probably the last question. Do you see the use of thermoelectric generators to solve the problem of battery miniaturization, ensuring constant charging of the battery? Yeah, that's actually a good question. And I will say that uh, this has been brought up many times. Uh, I have not yet worked out the, the uh, who's asking that question, by the way? Uh, this is a student from Georgia Tech, Prahalad oh, Murali. Yeah. Okay, uh, who, who, what's the name? Murali. Uh, Prahalad, yeah. Prahalad. Prahalad, yeah. this is actually a very good, very good question. And uh, if, uh, if you have some good ideas, maybe uh, we, we can chat about it and maybe you know we can think of some some approach here where we can do this where we can use thermoelectric generation to actually uh, you know continuously recharge the issue with all these with thermoelectric is actually that the power generator is actually quite low okay 
So, but for many applications, right, uh, especially to, to satisfy sleep, uh, uh, sleep mode sort of currents and so on, it may be adequate. So I think it's worth investigating. I haven't given it part, but if you're interested, uh, this is definitely a very good, good area to think about. Yeah. So, uh, Subo, maybe we'll take one last question and then uh, we need to stop, but this is an important one. Can you comment on the thermomechanical reliability aspect of these flexible substrates and how it compares to the traditional fan out packages? Okay, so the so for example, right, these are all fairly standalone. And as I explained to you, right, the Young's modulus of these materials are actually quite small, so they're actually quite compressible, right? And so, and also the elongation weight. The other thing I didn't talk too much about is the glass transition temperature. So if you take something like PDMS, right, the glass transition temperature is actually minus 200 degrees Celsius. So this thing is a glass already, okay, at room temperature. So it's extremely flexible. Mechanically, there's no problem, right? Now, if you talk about classical vapor level fan out, right, the stuff that you find in your foam, that is all rigid and like rigid, that becomes that is rigidized. After you cure, it becomes rigid, right? And then, okay, it behaves just like a rigid organic material. And yes, you know, the, the, the uh, coefficient of thermal mismatch and so on between the, the matrix, okay, which is this rigid epoxy molding compound and the, the dye, okay, are, are significant. And so those have to be considered. But for the flexible application, our choice of the molding compound actually ensures that this is not an issue because everything is compliant. Okay, I hope I answered that question. Who was whose was that? This was again from Georgia Tech, Pratik. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I um, hope I answered that question. Yeah. Yeah. So I think so we need to stop here. Yeah, yeah. Any questions, just email me and I'll try to yeah. answer them. Yeah.